I want to begin with a few thank yous, and one is to uh, our staff member, Katie Deeser, who's hopefully hearing this. Thank you, Katie, for all your work on this evening. <laughs> Soon to be sophomore. Soon to be sophomore. I'm only sorry that uh, Virginia Martin could not be here with us tonight, but I'm pretty sure she's going to watch the video, so let's give her a round of applause. It's the generosity of Virginia and her late husband, John Martin, who made all of this possible. Uh, they are great friends and great supporters of Catholic preaching, so we really are indebted to them for all that they do for us. Um, I want to thank, uh, among others, I want to be sure to thank the musicians who assisted mm -hmm. at Mass tonight. You guys were great. You brought it. Yay. Oh, they didn't rock tonight, thank God. But. Friends, our speaker tonight probably doesn't need an introduction, and no introduction is probably going to measure up to uh, the uh, stature of the man. Uh, Father John Meyer is certainly one of our best-known faculty members here at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, among other things, he is a native New Yorker. He obtained his <laughs> BA in philosophy from St. Joseph Seminary at Dunwoody. Uh, also, he has the licentiate in theology from the Gregorian University in Rome and a doctorate in sacred scripture from the Biblical Institute in Rome. Uh, his doctoral dissertation was uh, published in the Analecta Biblical series of the Institute. Before coming to Notre Dame, he taught for 14 years, uh, I'm sorry, 12 years at St. Joseph Seminary in Dunwoody, New York followed by 14 years at the Catholic University of, of America, and he's now been with us here at Notre Dame for 21 years. He is uh, best known to many of us as the author of an ongoing series, A Marginal Jew. Now, unbelievably, he's working on volume six. Please welcome Father John Meyer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, am I turned on? You're fine. Okay. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Mike. And among the many people I might thank tonight from music providers, servers, everybody who has helped to make this a lovely evening, please accept my thanks. And certainly, especially to the Martin Family, it was delightful to meet you tonight. And as I told Jenny, please know that I will offer Mass this Sunday for Virginia, uh, praying for her good health and happiness. Please tell her that. Whether I am giving a homily or a lecture or a whole course, I always try to follow the hermeneutics of Alice in Wonderland. Begin at the beginning, and when you come to the end, stop. <laughs> so perhaps I should begin this lecture at the very beginning, almost sounds like the sound of music, by explaining its odd title, phrase by phrase. <clears throat> 
For instance, practice and theory might appear to be putting the two nouns in the wrong order, the pastoral cart before the theological horse. In reality, though, this reverse order of the nouns has been selected with rhetorical malice aforethought. To be honest, I am suspicious of abstract theories of preaching that di dictate a priori the various rules that the preacher must conform to. Rather, this evening I am purposely reversing the order of theory and practice I will first reflect on my own actual experience and then, after telling you the long story of preaching over more than half a century, only then will I try to spin out some threads of theory from each stage of my development along the way. And yes, you've heard right over 50 years I started preaching on a regular basis as a newly ordained when I was 25, and now I am 76. That, by the way, is the reason for the odd phrase and pun at the end of the title of our talk, the practice and theory of one elder presbyter. As most of you know, the Greek word presbyteros, the origin of the words presbyter and priest, basically means an old man. <laughs> Indeed, I had first thought of calling the talk the practice and theory of an elder elder, but that seemed too much of a literal translation of presbyteros, presbyteros, the sort of learned obfuscation we find in our present Roman Missal. <laughs> the first part of this talk also deserves an explanation. Public speaking in general and even preaching in general is much too broad a topic for a single lecture. So I narrowed down the focus to my own chief experience of public speaking, namely the preaching that a Catholic priest or deacon undertakes at Mass. By the way, I therefore ask for your kind indulgence if I speak of his or him preaching at Mass. I am well aware that women do an excellent job of preaching in various venues. I go to the Catholic Biblical Association every year, where in our liturgies women have a regular role in preaching and teaching. And hopefully those roles for women will increase, especially if, as I hope, the church restores the office of women deacons. But again tonight, I am limiting my reflections to my own experience as a Catholic priest. If I wish to speak of my lived experience of preaching, I think the best way of doing that would be to trace the various stages of my preaching career, scare quotes, presenting first the various audiences I had to face during the various phases of my priesthood, second, the individual challenges that the particular audience posed, and third, what lessons or theory, if you like, what lessons I took away from the encounter. So a sort of Bildungsroman of a naive Catholic kid from the old South Bronx. Come to think of it, maybe I should have entitled this talk a homiletic Aeneid instead. After all, Virgil's Aeneid tells the tale not of a man returning home, as with Ulysses in the Odyssey, but rather of a bewildered Aeneas searching for a new home across the Mediterranean, a search that involves many adventures and misadventures along the way. This actually fits my own homiletic Aeneid perfectly, since my journey through different homiletic strategies went hand in hand with my physical journey from one geographical spot to the next. <laughs> 
<clears throat> of course, Aeneas's journey began with a disaster, the destruction of Troy. By a not entirely happy analogy, my first full-time experience of preaching in a parish was likewise a disaster. <clears throat> a disaster unwittingly engineered by my kind clerical superiors. <laughs> you see, the Archdiocese of New York sent me, <clears throat> after just two years in the major seminary, to study theology in Rome for four years at the Gregorian University in Rome. Residence, or rather imprisonment, was at the North American College on the Juniculum Hill next to the Vatican. Each school day, we seminarians were bussed down to the Greg, lest we be contaminated by the holy city in which we were living. <laughs> and there at the Greg, the whole morning was spent listening to lectures in Latin, reading textbooks, in Latin, taking oral and written exams in Latin. We even studied Greek and Hebrew in <laughs> Latin. <laughs> I always apologize to my Jewish confers in the theology department when we're discussing Hebrew grammar because I will immediately say, well, is that a pausa mayor, a pausa, pausa minor? And they're looking at me as though I had two heads. Well, back at the North American College, uh, once we got back there after our day at the Greg, there was no extended formal course in preaching, just a couple of practice sessions with the critique supplied by my equally inexperienced confreres. You may begin to sense why, after four years of this, when I returned as a newly ordained priest to my first New York parish, my initial attempt at preaching was a total fiasco. After a brief summer stint as hospital chaplain in a major New York medical center, a pastoral baptism of fire for which I had had no preparation whatever in Rome, I was sent to one of the most affluent and educated suburban parishes in the archdiocese, namely Bronxville, New York, a golden square mile in southern Westchester. Whether this was deemed a reward or a punishment is not clear to me even <laughs> now. To be sure, a good part of the parish was highly educated. One of the regular lectors at my Sunday mass was the dean of the Fordham Law School. Nothing to make you a little bit nervous. Still, these poor people weren't prepared for the homilies delivered in a type of English that was really Latin with English endings put on the words. <laughs> Indeed, my homilies resembled nothing as much as the style of our present Roman Missal, a transliteration instead of a translation, resulting in verbiage that was pompous, pretentious, awkward, convoluted, and hopelessly abstract. There was, however, a silver lining to this murky homiletic cloud. I was painfully aware how unnatural my English had become, because whenever a parishioner would ask a question about religion, I would reply in a quasi-Latin that quickly ended the conversation. So I decided that the only cure was to adopt a painful discipline. I started writing out my homilies and then rewriting them and rewriting, struggling to break down the long Ciceronian periods. They may look great in the writings of Cardinal Duman, but don't exactly tickle American ears in present day congregations. Like it or not, we are all the heirs of the terse, clipped English of Ernest Hemingway, Graham Greene, John Updike, and a million other novelists, not to mention the end-time plague of email 
Twitter, and texting. And so I began the laborious process of putting my rotund, Latinate English into the atom smasher of ruthless editing to try to get a message that my audience could grasp on the first bounce, the only bounce they ever get, and most homilists forget that. But then, once I got to the pulpit, I found myself falling into the trap of expanding on my written text, winding up in a rabbit hole of some obscure side point. So I understood uh, and that I had to undertake a still more painful discipline. Maybe I should have joined the Trappist instead. <laughs> Once I was satisfied with my reasonably English-sounding text, I would try to memorize it, reciting it aloud again and again as I paced up and down in my sitting room. Needless to say, this was not easy, especially for a priest involved in day-to-day -day active ministry in a parish when you never knew when the phone would ring and you were needed over in the nearby hospital. So some weeks I succeeded in memorizing the homily, other weeks I didn't. But the times I did succeed taught me an important added benefit to this painful discipline, namely direct eye contact and therefore direct psychological contact with the people who were at least trying to listen to you, so that at least I was speaking to them instead of reading to them. After all, after three scripture readings on Sunday, the last thing the people need is another reading, a fourth reading that does not enjoy the charism of inspiration the way at least the first three readings did, and therefore do, does not enjoy the warrant of demanding the people's attention for that reason. Although I think some homilists do think their homilies are inspired. <laughs> um, by the way, if you want to see the difference between delivering a homily and just reading a text, I would send you to a somewhat unlikely source the Daily Mass on the EWTN Catholic Network. Now, while its liturgy on the whole is a sobering lesson of what the Mass will look like when the robots take over and get <laughs> ordained, one also gets to observe a vital difference in preaching styles. Some of the older, more experienced priests will speak directly to the audience and therefore to the camera, hello there, <laughs> while at times referring to the text they've written out, a wise backstop I always use as well. Many of the younger, less confident priests will instead read a text to the people, a text that I would argue is probably the, not their own composition, judging by the number of times they stumble over the leaden prose they're reading. To be sure, homiletic surface, uh, services can provide a very useful function supplying initial ideas, useful anecdotes, technical information about the scriptures. But such homiletic aids are deadly as a substitute for a real homily. Were still some of these diffident priests on EWTN would simply announce a topic with a very tenuous connection with the scripture readings just proclaimed, and then they would proceed to read the numbered paragraphs on the topic from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, even announcing the number of each paragraph as they pursued their painful pilgrimage. The horror, the horror. <laughs> but back to my own Indian. Unfortunately, I never had a chance to develop my parish preaching strategy, all that discipline gone for nothing. Since 
after one year in Bronxville, I was yanked back to Rome for a four-year stint at the Biblical Institute, where I earned first my license and then my doctorate in scripture. Suddenly, my homiletic audience was made up not of educated lay people, but of fellow priests also pursuing doctoral degrees. We lived in an 18th century convent repurposed as a graduate house of the North American College called the Casa. It was close to the Trevi Fountain in downtown Rome. And curiously, this hothouse of clerical ambition and climbing was located on Humility Street. <laughs> I, I kid you not. And the Madonna, who was the patroness of the whole house with a great uh, portrait and near the front door, was Our Lady of Humility. I think she had her hands full with that particular job. At any event, every weekday at noon, having just returned from our classes at the different universities, of course still in Latin, a group of us would gather in a small upstairs chapel, you might call it the upper room, to celebrate mass and to take turns delivering a short homily, all too often, it would seem, extempore, and certainly without a written text. The congregation was an odd mix of priests studying systematic or moral theology or church history, or most often, the ever popular canon law. This challenging audience demanded a whole new strategy for homiletics. After all, all of us were immersed in our own theological cubbyhole. And so the danger was that each of us would try to, try to wow our colleagues with our expertise in some abstruse area. It was then that I began to realize that the best antidote to I can out expertise any kid on the block homily was rather to take a sort of U-turn in my own strategy, in the way I tried to open up the scriptures to the special audience of Brother Priest. I began purposely, and perhaps maliciously, to uh, pepper my exposition of the scriptures with the concrete examples taken from our crazy everyday life in chaotic downtown Rome with all the unattended humor arising from American academic exiles fumbling through their interactions with the bemused natives. It was here, precisely as I was engaged in intense investigation of the Hebrew and Greek text at class, it was here that I realized that all this formal study must indeed precede and inform the homily without forming the very content of the homily. In preparation for preaching, especially in the more formal Sunday masses we would have in the main chapel of the Casa, I would indeed begin by digging deep into the scripture commentaries spread out on my desk. Only in the end, to throw away 95% of all the information I had gathered in a brutal act of intellectual asceticism. At the center of my homily, I decided, should stand the one hard gem of insight, the one homiletic pearl of great price, which could speak to the daily experience, exasperating or funny, of my fellow students. Well, when I returned after four years to New York with the doctorate in hand, I found myself facing a very different challenge, a strange split screen homiletic existence. Split screen, let's delve into that. During the week, I lived and taught at the major seminary in Yonkers, New York, often presiding and preaching at the noonday mass. Indeed, sometimes I would wind preaching up, preaching on the very gospel I had just been lecturing on 
in the last class of the morning. Here, the danger of turning a homily into a lecture became extremely acute, all the more so because of the cloistered, not to say claustrophobic atmosphere of some seminaries in the 1970s. That doesn't, of course, happen today. In an attempt to drag a cordon off existence into the world outside with its culture, high and low, I began delivering what became to be known among the seminarians as my book review or movie review homilies. James Joyce, that irredeemably Catholic ex-Catholic, was one staple, both in his portrait of an artist and more difficultly in Ulysses. For instance, once on the solemnity of the Annunciation, just to wake up the congregation, I juxtaposed the Virgin Mary's yes to Gabriel alongside Molly Bloom's stream of consciousness soliloquy at the end of Ulysses, a soliloquy that ends the whole novel with Molly Bloom saying to her future husband, yes, I said yes, I will, yes. The same life-giving yes of a woman in a somewhat different context. John Updike's novels wound up both in an Easter vigil homily and in a seminary penance service, a penance service that Updike, I think, could have probably used very well for himself. But not all cultural references were quite that high. After all, one had to vary the pitch. For instance, a 1977 homily used a just released and as yet not very well known movie called Star Wars. I employed the film as an allegory of life in the seminary, including, <laughs> including, I admit this was awful, but including a veiled reference to the rector as Darth Vader. Now, that really wasn't uncharitable since at that point almost nobody in the congregation knew who Darth Vader was. <laughs> of course, they found out later. <laughs> now, all these experiments in homiletics were meant not simply to amuse and be muse, but also to model se to seminarians different ways in which the preacher must connect a 2,000-year-old text with a culture both pop and refined in which different New York congregations were immersed or possibly drowning. As you might guess, my attempts were met with mixed reactions. For example, my suggestion on the feast of Francis of Assisi that the parable of the Good Samaritan is really an anti-clerical joke told by the layman Jesus to his Jewish lay audience was not universally welcomed. <laughs> but such is the risk you always take when you try to plug in a cloistered community into the socket of messy daily life in the real world. Sometimes you get electrocuted. <laughs> this then was one half of my split screen homiletic life in New York. The other half of the split screen was on view every Sunday and Holy Day when I would drive down to the Bronx to preach at two masses in the huge, bustling, family-oriented parish of St. Barnabas. It was a mix of blue-collar and white-collar workers, mostly of Irish and Italian descent. As you entered the parish boundaries, you got the strange sense of stepping into a time machine that whisked you back to a parish of New York in the 1950s. Saturdays and Sundays were filled with masses, weddings, funerals, confessions, in the upstairs church, in the downstairs church, across the street in the chapel, really a large auditorium, of the parish high school. Yes, this parish had its own high school as well as grade school. The 1950s returned. 
This whole liturgical three ring circus was presided over by a wonderful pastor with a heart of gold and no sense of organization or order whatever. <laughs> From Sunday to Sunday, you never knew what was going to go wrong. You just knew it was. <laughs> Hence, the homiletic challenge of the parish was precisely that of, over the well-ordered, dare I say, over-ordered intellectual seminary. How did one show these ever busy, ever distracted, stopping in for mass on the way to for shopping parishioner, that the puzzling biblical text they heard each Sunday did address their daily lives? I decided that I had to reverse my seminary strategy. Now, the first part of my reverse strategy might seem counterintuitive. I decided that I had to inject a certain amount of formal instruction into my homilies. For on the one hand, these people had not just come out of one of my lecture classes on the Gospels. On the other hand, they knew all too well the challenges and frustrations that their workaday world possessed. They didn't mean, need my explanation or exposition on that topic. My challenge rather was to show them how a parable Jesus spoke to Galilean Jews 2,000 years ago, or worse still, a dispute he had with the Pharisees on the Jewish law 2,000 years ago, spoke as well to them and their daily struggles today. And that inevitably required explaining something about the first century Jewish world that Jesus the Jew inhabited and how it related to our world. In New York, that was a little bit easier when it came to Jews than it might be in South Bend. And there was a special subliminal bonus to this approach. By constantly emphasizing Jesus the Jew, little did I know what I'd be doing later on in life, but by constantly emphasizing Jesus the Jew, I was hopefully injecting some antibodies into the body of Christ against its historical anti-Semitism. Immediately, you know, I have to admit, the reaction to the parishioners, uh, by the parishioners to my parish strategy of preaching was mixed. Some parishioners would go out of their way after mass to tell me how much they appreciated my explaining the readings to them. In fact, at times it was almost comical when a parishioner would grab me on the street a week later and start talking about some point I had made in last Sunday's homily and I couldn't remember what the point was because I was worrying about next Sunday's homily instead. At the same time, other people in my audience were not so pleased. Some found my homilies too abstract and theoretical. Others were looking for that make me feel good pep talk more at home with the mega church homilies they were hearing on TV. I sometimes took consolation in St. Paul's declared intention of being all things to all people. Well, the, uh, the contentious content of Paul's more polemical epistles indicates that he did not always succeed in that goal, so why should I feel too bad if I didn't succeed either? Indeed, on some Sunday afternoons, I have to admit, as I was leaving the parish, I found myself muttering to myself the opening words of Jesus' meta-parable on preaching. The sower went out to sow his seed. Who knows whether or where the seed of God's word would fall and germinate? As I found out, sometimes the seed bears fruit very slowly. The farmer must wait with patience. <laughs>
That truth was brought home to me just a few years ago in a very intriguing way. Out of the blue, I suddenly got an email from an American executive working in Japan for a company with offices there. He started the email by mentioning to me that he had all the volumes of my series, A Marginal Jew, lined up on his bookshelf in his Japanese apartment. Interesting image. But then the main point of his email was something else. He wrote, quote, you probably don't remember me, but I often served your mass at St. Barnabas. As a 13-year-old questioning his faith, I was usually turned off by the pablum I was fed at mass and in religion class. But your homilies, even though I didn't understand everything you were saying at the time, your homilies made me realize that there was a richer, deeper intellectual dimension to the Catholic faith, deeper than what I knew. Those homilies set me on a path of discovery, searching for that deeper Catholicism." End quote. The sower went out to sow his seed. Perhaps the ultimate lesson I learned from my split-screen years in New York was that in composing any homily, you must constantly keep before your mind's eye the particular congregation you will be addressing. And even at St. Barnabas, you know, did I have the Saturday night masses, early morning Sunday, the Alka-Seltzer crowd later on Sunday, it did make a difference. As I would begin the process of writing my homily in the seminary, the first step was almost always the same, consulting the scripture commentaries and other books that explained the assigned readings, then identifying the key message in one scripture reading that I decided to focus on. By the way, and here I'm getting into disputed territory. People certainly have other views on this. But in my own opinion, I think it's a mistake to try to tie together all three scripture Sunday readings in one homily. First of all, the time allotted on Sunday for a Catholic as opposed to a Protestant homily is quite restricted and doesn't allow for such a grand plan. And anyway, the second reading always is going on on its own particular cycle without any necessary rela relationship to the first and third readings. In any case, as I read the commentaries, I would keep making notes to myself, testing this idea and then that idea until I could finally settle on one of them. But then came always, it comes, the crunch. How do I transition from my explanation of the biblical passage I chose to the second the most important part of the homily, namely the relevance of this message to that particular congregation in my mind's eye sitting in front of me. Here is where I would start furiously pacing up and down in front of my desk, trying one approach, approach then trying another, trying to find a particular link between text and people, and when that didn't work, I'd try again. Here is why my split screen experience brought home to me a basic truth. And when I think of it in retrospect, I should have known this all along. My initial spade work in probing the scripture readings might always follow the same pattern, but the second half of my homily had to be different, radically different for the blue collar worker at St. Barnabas than it would be for a seminary faculty, and students. I was just mentioning a table. This became more severe the year that I was asked to do the Lenten homilies in St. Patrick's Cathedral on Sunday in the presence of the Cardinal. Talk about Tension City. But more importantly, you realize, since I had to take the Saturday evening masses at St. Barnabas to do the 10 o'clock Cardinal's Mass on Sunday at Cathedral, you realize you simply could not give the two homilies 
in the two locations. In a sense, the German form critics were right about one thing, Sitz im Leben, the setting in life of the particular audience is everything. My struggle dealing with homiletic challenge of the split screen continued in a still more complicated way when after 12 years at the New York Seminary, I moved to Washington, D.C., the swamp on the Potomac, to become the professor of New Test. Of course, any New Yorker just can't stand Washington. <laughs> anyway, I moved to Washington, D.C. to become the professor of New Testament in the Biblical Studies Department at Catholic University. The homiletic split screen now divided into three parts. At times on weekdays, I would preach a mass in the basement, more properly called the crypt church, of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, located on the same campus as the university. This was the closest I came in Washington to a parish experience such as I had had in New York, but with a vital difference. I suddenly woke up to the fact that up until now, my audiences had been almost totally white. But in the northeast quadrant of Washington, D.C., both at mass and in the confessionals, I was confronted with the sufferings and indignities that African-American Catholics faced on a daily basis. Questions of race, politics, social justice, topics that had not, to my disgrace, loomed all that large in my preaching in New York, now became unavoidable. How to address these burning issues without turning the pulpit into the coward's castle, denouncing racial justice and perhaps engaging in partisan politics from a safe distance, the safe and privileged distance of a white priest living on the guarded grounds of a university campus. All this involved a delicate balancing act that I admit I never completely mastered. But at least my Washington experience in the crypt church drove home to me something I had not sufficiently appreciated in New York. In the dynamic back and forth of communication essential to a homily, I am not simply instructing and forming the congregation. The congregation is instructing and informing me. The split in the split screen became gigantic, however, when on various occasions I moved upstairs to preside and preach at one of the Sunday Masses in the National Shrine. Even if you've only seen the upper church on TV, you have some sense of the vast space that can accommodate 10,000 people, people of widely different races and nationalities, tourists from all over the world, Protestants and Catholics alike. It's just a tourist site you have to see in Washington. Most people with the Blue Dome refer to it as the Blue Mosque. Well, diversity is wonderful. But how and what do you preach to such a diverse group? My solution was to focus on the biblical passage that spoke most directly to the human condition and the human dilemma on a large scale. The basic questions of life and death and suffering and meaning that any intelligent man or woman must face. I would then try to shine the light of the gospel on these problems that we all share simply because we're human. At the same time, I would try to enliven what was in danger of becoming a grand university lecture with some recent events from the Washington political circus. And believe me, it's always been a circus. Obviously, though, before such a huge and variegated audience, I had to be careful to avoid taking sides in political disputes. 
This was tricky business, but at least it made concrete for me something I had always known theoretically, but now practice was actually teaching me the truth. The books of the Bible arise out of and speak to particular political, social, and economic context. At times, analogies to life in DC almost demanded to be heard, yet I had to tread carefully. No pulpit belongs to the preacher, especially the pulpit of the largest Catholic church in the Western Hemisphere, and especially in Washington, D.C., no pulpit should be converted into a political podium. Well, the third part of my Washington split screen was quite different again. The chapel in Caldwell Hall, the home of CU's School of Theology. There, my congregation was largely faculty and students from the theology school, from every conceivable ecclesiastical discipline under the sun, canon law being the ever popular favorite. Obviously, here the exposition of the biblical text could be more technical, though this Zitzenleben brought home to me how easy it was to fall into academic jargon as a substitute for original and penetrating thought. Curiously, it was in the Caldwell Chapel that I began to sense that the real challenge of preaching to religious academics is that they know all the biblical stories. They know the theological language, and many of them even know the biblical languages all too well. Familiarity breeds, if not contempt, something worse a theological ear that has grown deaf from too much physical hearing, but not enough spiritual listening. How does one break through this barrier of feeling that I've heard this a hundred times before, especially when the gospel is, the sower went out to sow his seed. This problem of preaching to the biblically well-versed became all the more acute when after 14 years at Catholic University, I moved here to Notre Dame, the end, as far as I can tell, of my homiletic Aeneid. Like Aeneas, I did not come home and find it new. I came to a new place and found it home. Yet it proved to be a home most challenging as well as most welcoming. After teaching at any number of Catholic institutions here and abroad, be it full time or for summer school or for a series of lectures, I had come at last to the premier Catholic seat of higher education and especially theological and biblical education in the United States. Now, this is not flattery for the sake of captatio benevolence. It is simply the empirical truth. Hence the problem of preaching to the biblically literate already felt at CU reached a critical culmination here. In the homily here, I could prattle on endlessly about grace and redemption and incarnation without ever breathing God's spirit into the dry bones of biblical language to make them live again. Son of man, shall these bones live? That is a question every homilist faces in every homily. How do you break through the overfamiliar words to reach the strange reality? Well, in my classes, I would sometimes suggest to my students that our biblical and theological language all too easily becomes like large stones in a stream. The stones were originally odd-sized with sharp edges and therefore difficult to handle or lift. Over many years, the flowing current of time and usage 
wears down the rough stones so that they become smooth, flat surfaces without any cutting edge or difficult, distinctive, disturbing shape. So too, through too much unthinking usage, the word of God can become not a sharp two-edged sword, but a plastic butter knife supplied for airplane food. <laughs> How does the homilist overcome this domestication of God's word among the cognoscenti? Well, in a jarring switch of metaphor, sort of metaphorical whiplash, I would commend to my students the bizarre image of the word of God as a divinely offered walnut. The hard encasing inedible surface of the walnut is like the carapace that forms around God's word from too much predictable preaching and teaching, arousing yawns instead of shock. It is this unthinking repetition that surrounds the text with the hard shell of I've heard this all before. So that the outer shell of the text closes up rather than opens up the nourishing meat of God's word within the bread of life encased in custom. Especially in the congregation of the religiously learned, it is the job of the homilist to smash open the hard surface of the walnut the smooth shell of rote religion with the hammer of the surprising, even discomforting metaphor, the arresting anecdote, the at first glance inappropriate allusion to pop culture, or the disturbing reference to the latest scandal in church or state or academy. How does one do that, though? with a great deal of unstructured pondering and tearing your hair out while pacing the floor in one's study, but also with a great deal of prayer and meditation, invoking the spirit who first inspired these texts. The same spirit who alone can inspire the homilist to move his congregation from knowledge to wisdom, from thinking Christian to living Christian and being Christian. Indeed, come to think of it, I should have mentioned prayer to the Holy Spirit at the very beginning of this narrative of my homiletic journey, for he was certainly constant, if unseen companion, advocate and paraclete at my side along the way. I feel sure that he was also the driving force on every step of my homiletic, as well as my geographical Aeneid. Even now, whenever I begin to write a homily, and before I begin every class, I silently pray, Veni Creator Spiritus, come, O Spirit, that creates, that makes new. At the end of these reflections, one might object that this homiletic Aeneid does not arrive at some safe harbor, some neat home, some final resting place where you and I can feel that now we have learned everything we could or should about preaching. But that is exactly the feeling I want to avoid. I hope rather that all of us feel a need to continue the journey, to test new paths, never imagining that we have ever plumbed a scripture text once and for all, or that we have found the one strategy for preaching to a congregation. Actually, my refusal to supply a pat conclusion, a question of how to preach once and for all, a refusal, as it were, to hand out a high-level version of homiletics for dummies matches perfectly Virgil's own Aeneid. Virgil died 
before he could complete his epic, and hence book 12 of the Aeneid ends abruptly. Aeneid, Aeneas never gets to found the city of Rome or the race of the Romans. So too I have an acute sense that my homiletic Aeneid has not and cannot arrive at a final port of anchorage. I still have much to learn on my homiletic journey. And I hope that as long as I have the breath of life within me to preach, the dialectic, the interplay of practice and theory will continue to teach this elder presbyter the way forward and perhaps the way home. Veni Creator Spiritus. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah, if, if people still, uh, if uh, I don't want to keep anybody who has another appointment, but I would be happy to answer some questions if anybody.